1970, a mother purchased an antique Raggedy Ann doll from a hobby store. The doll had been a birthday present for her daughter, Donna. Donna was preparing to graduate from college with a nursing degree. She lived in a tiny apartment with her roommate, Angie. Pleased with the cute Raggedy Ann doll, Donna placed it on her bed as a decoration and did not give it a second thought. But within days, both Donna and Angie noticed that there appeared to be something very strange and creepy about the doll. The doll mysteriously seemed to move about the house, doing relatively small movements at first, such as a change in position. But as time passed, the movement became more noticeable. Donna and Angie would come home to find the doll in a completely different room. Sometimes the doll would be found with its legs crossed, its arms folded, and other times it would be found upright, standing on its feet. Several times, Donna sometimes left the doll on the couch before leaving for work, and would return to find the doll back in her room on the bed with the door closed. Annabelle the doll not only moved, but could write as well. About a month into their experiences, Donna and Angie began to find messages on parchment paper that read, Help Us and Help Lou. The handwriting was as if written by a small child, but the creepy part about the messages was not the wording, but the way they were written. At the time, Donna had never kept any sort of parchment paper within her apartment, on which the notes were written. So, where did this parchment paper come from in the first place? One night, Donna came home to find that the doll had moved once again, but this time it was on her bed. Donna had come to find that this was typical of the doll, but somehow knew this time it was different. Something was not right. A sense of fear came over her when she inspected the doll and saw what looked like blood drops on the back of its hands and on its chest. Seemingly from nowhere, a liquidy rev substance had appeared on the doll. Scared and desperate, Donna and Angie decided it was time to seek expert advice. Not knowing where to turn to, they contacted a medium and a seance was held. Donna was then introduced to the spirit of Annabelle Higgins. The medium related the story of Annabelle to both Donna and Angie. Annabelle was a young girl that resided on the property before the apartments were built. They were happy times. She was a young girl of only seven years when her lifeless body was found on the field upon which the apartment complex now stood. The spirit related to the medium that she felt comfort with Donna and Angie and wanted to stay with them and be loved. Feeling compassion for Annabelle and her story, Donna gave her permission to inhibit the doll and stay with them. They were to soon find out, however, that Annabelle was not what she appeared to be. This was no ordinary case, and definitely not an ordinary doll. Lou was a friend of Donna and Angie and had been with them since the day the doll had arrived. Lou had never been very fond of the doll, and on several occasions warned Donna that it was evil and to just get rid of it. But Donna had a compassionate tie to the doll, and not giving much credence to Lou's feelings, kept it. Donna's decision, however, turned out to be a terrible mistake. Lou awoke one night from a deep sleep and in a panic. Once again, he had had a reoccurring bad dream. Only this time, somehow, something seemed different. It was as though he was awake but couldn't move. He looked around the room but couldn't discern anything out of the ordinary. But then, it happened. Looking down toward his feet, he saw the doll. Annabelle. It began to slowly glide up his leg, 
moved over his chest, and then stopped. Within seconds, the doll began to strangle him. Paralyzed and gasping for breath, Lou, at the point of asphyxiation, blacked out. When he awoke the next morning, he was certain it was not a dream. Lou was determined to rid himself of that doll and the spirit that possessed it. Lou, however, would have one more terrifying experience with Annabelle. Preparing for a road trip the next day, Lou and Angie were reading over maps alone in their apartment. The apartment seemed eerily quiet, when suddenly, rustling sounds coming from Donna's bedroom aroused fear that someone had possibly broken into their apartment. Lou, determined to find out who or whatever it was, quietly made his way to the bedroom door. He waited for the noises to stop before entering and turning on the light. The room was empty except for Annabelle whom was tossed on the floor in the corner of the room. Lou scoured the room for forced entry, but nothing was out of place. As he got close to the doll, he got the distinct impression that somebody was behind him. Spinning around, he was quick to realize that nobody else was there. Then, in a sudden flash, he found himself grabbing for his chest, doubled over, cut and bleeding. His shirt was stained with blood, and upon opening his shirt, there on his chest was what looked to be seven distinct claw marks, three vertically and four horizontally. All were like hot burns. These scratches healed almost immediately, half gone the next day, and fully gone by day two. Finally, Donna was willing to believe that the spirit in the house was not that of a young girl, but only an inhuman and demonic creature in nature. After Lou's experiences, Donna felt it was time to seek real expert advice and contacted a priest named Father Hegan. Father Hegan felt it was a spiritual matter and felt he needed to contact a higher authority in the church. So he contacted Father Cook, who immediately contacted the Warrens. Ed and Lorraine Warren immediately took interest in the case and contacted Donna concerning the doll. The Warrens, after speaking with Donna, Angie, and Lou, came to the immediate conclusion that the doll itself was not in fact possessed, but manipulated by an inhuman presence. Spirits do not possess inanimate objects like houses or toys. They possess people. An inhuman spirit can attach itself to a place or an object, and this is what occurred in the Annabelle case. The spirit manipulated the doll and created the illusion of it being alive in order to get recognition. Truly, the spirit was not looking to stay attached to the doll. It was looking to possess a human host. The spirit, or in this case, an inhuman demonic spirit, was essentially in the infestation stage of the phenomenon. It first began by moving the doll around the apartment by means of teleportation to arouse the occupant's curiosity in hopes that they would give it recognition. Then, predictably, the mistake of bringing a medium into the apartment to communicate with it. The inhuman spirit, now able to communicate through the medium, preyed upon the girl's emotional vulnerabilities by pretending to be a rather harmless lost girl, with which during the seance was allowed permission from Donna to haunt the apartment. As a demonic and negative spirit, it then set about causing patently negative phenomena to occur. It aroused fear through the weird movements of the doll. It brought about the materialization of disturbing, handwritten notes, the symbolic drops of blood on the doll, and ultimately, it even attacked Lou, leaving behind the symbolic marks of the beast. The next stage of the infestation phenomenon would have been complete human possession, had the experiences lasted another two or three weeks. The spirit would have completely possessed, or harmed, 
or even killed one or all of the occupants in the house. At the conclusion of the investigation, the Warrens felt it appropriate to have a recitation of an exorcism blessing by Father Cook to cleanse the apartment. The blessing of the home was a wordy seven-page document that is distinctively positive in nature. Rather than specifically expelling evil entities from the dwelling, the emphasis is instead directed toward filling the home with the power of the positive and of God. At Donna's request, and as a further precaution against the phenomena ever occurring in the house again, the Warrens took the big rag doll along with them when they left. Father Cook, although uncomfortable with his role as an exorcist, agreed to perform the seven-page rite of exorcism, a doctrine he recited through the apartment at which point the Warrens were confident the entity would no longer reside there. They agreed to take the rag doll back home with them. Upon leaving, Ed placed the doll in the back seat and agreed he would not take the interstate in the event the inhuman spirit still resided within the doll. His suspicions were all too correct in no time, as the Warrens felt themselves as an object of a vicious hatred. Then, at each dangerous curve, the car would swerve and stall with every corner, causing the power steering and the brakes to even fail. Repeatedly, the car verged on collision. Ed reached into the back seat, into the black bag, and took out a vial of holy water and doused the doll, making the sign of the cross over it. The disturbances stopped immediately, and the Warrens arrived safely home. After the Warrens arrived home, Ed sat the doll in the chair next to his desk. The doll levitated a number of times in the beginning, then it seemed to fall inert. During the ensuing weeks, however, it began showing up in various rooms of the house. When the Warrens were away and had the doll locked up in the outer office building, they would often return to find it sitting comfortably upstairs in Ed's easy chair when they opened the main front door. The doll also showed a hatred for clergymen who came to the house. In one instance, Father Jason Bradford, a Catholic exorcist, came to the house. Upon seeing the doll seated in the chair, he picked it up and claimed that it was just a rag doll and it couldn't hurt anyone. He proceeded to then tossing the doll back into the chair, at which point Ed claimed that he should not have stated that. Upon leaving an hour later, Lorraine pleaded to the priest to please be careful driving and to call her when he arrived home. Lorraine discerned tragedy for this young priest but he had to go his way. A few hours later, Father Jason called Lorraine and explained that his brakes had filled as he entered a busy intersection. He was involved in a near fatal accident, destroying his vehicle. This was just one of the many such events that occurred over the next few years. The Warrens had a special case built for Annabelle inside the occult museum where she resides to this day. Since the case was built, Annabelle no longer appeared to move, but she is thought to be responsible for the death of a young man who came to the museum on his motorcycle with his girlfriend. The young man, after hearing Ed's account of the doll, defiantly went up and began to bang on the case, insisting that if the doll can put scratches on people, then he wanted to also be scratched. Ed claimed to the young man that he needed to leave, and proceeded to exiting him out of the building along with his girlfriend. On the way home, the young man and his girlfriend were laughing and making fun of the doll, when suddenly he lost control of his motorcycle and went head on into a tree. The young man was killed instantly, but his girlfriend survived and was hospitalized for over a year. When asked what happened, the young woman explained that they were laughing about the doll when they lost control of the motorcycle. Ed Warren warns people to this day to not challenge evil because no man is more powerful than Satan. Believe what you may, but these accounts 
of Annabelle to this day remain legit. And Annabelle still resides in the occult museum to this day, waiting for the right moment to strike. For it is rumored, Annabelle is waiting for the warrants to pass, so that yet again, she can escape and claim yet another pair of innocent hosts.